Between November 1915 and May 1916, Britain and France agreed a secret deal for dividing the Ottoman Empire should the European allies win the First World War. And so, now we can draw a map. The young British politician, Sir Mark Sykes, and the French lawyer turned diplomat, François Georges Picot, drew borders that best suited their own interests, the sykes picot Agreement. It cut across a separate deal the British had already made with Sharif Hussein of Mecca to support him in creating a Hashemite Arab kingdom in return for his leading an Arab revolt against the Ottomans. The south of Anatolia, eastern Turkey, and the Syrian coast down to Beirut were put under direct French control, while Basra and Baghdad were placed under direct British control. Mosul and Damascus were under French protection and called Area A. The rest of Mesopotamia and the southern Levant were put under British protection and called Area B. Jerusalem was designated as an international zone. But soon after the deal was struck, some voices in London began expressing dissatisfaction with what Britain had agreed in the secret negotiations. General Hall كتب انتقاد حاد للاتفاقية وفي نص انتقاد ما معناه كيف نحن يعني نقبل بنعطي الفرنسيين كل هذا وفي هناك آمال وطموحات يهودية في فلسطين. Well, if we cannot have Palestine, my government will certainly not allow Britain to control it. And my government would take the same view. Sykes and Pico could not agree over the future of Palestine when they did their deal at the end of 1915. And they agreed it would have an international administration. But neither side liked that as, a, uh, as an outcome. And the British didn't like it in particular because it left the east bank of the Suez Canal exposed to an administration that could be governed by who knows who. So the British immediately started to think of a way to get round the Sykes-Picot Agreement. So in fact, Sykes almost immediately, before the ink of François-Georges Picot's signature is dry, goes, starts talking to the Zionists. The Zionist movement grew up in the late 19th century with the ultimate aim of establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The Jewish lobby was growing in Britain and the British government took its aims seriously. The British might also use support for the Jews to persuade the American government, which included several Jewish figures, to join the war. Other factors may also have been at play. The Zionist movement itself and its leader, Chaim Weizmann, uh, were political Zionists, and their aim from the very beginning, the ultimate aim, was an independent Jewish state in Palestine. Though in these early days, they didn't say that because it had only evoked hostility to their project. أن يكون لنا تواجد في فلسطين تحت الإشراف البريطاني فمعنى ذلك إنه إحنا بدال ما يكون لنا جزء صغير في فلسطين أن نأخذ كل فلسطين من الفرنسيين ونتخلص من التزاماتنا في سايكس بيكو لدرجة بعض المؤرخين يقولون لو لم توجد الحركة الصهيونية لاخترعت بريطانيا الحركة الصهيونية On the 2nd of November 1917 the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Arthur Balfour, wrote to the leading Jewish figure, Walter Rothschild, to say that his government viewed, with favor, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and would use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this project. A month before the Balfour Declaration, the new Bolshevik government in Russia 
following the revolution had made public the details of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, as it sought to distance itself from decisions made by its Tsarist predecessors. روسيا بعد الثورة فضحت تلك الاتفاقات لأن الثورة كانت معادية للإمبريالية معادية للرأسمالية وطبعا روسيا فضحت تلك الاتفاقات لأن رأت في تلك الاتفاقات الانتهاك السافر لحقوق الشعوب ل شرق الأوسط وكأداة لاستغلال واستعمار تلك الشعوب. The revelation from the Russians came while the Hashemites were fighting alongside the British in the Levant, so they realized the British were playing a double game. The British also recognized France's right to determine the future of large parts of the area that Sharif Hussein had expected to control. خلال 1917 1918 الاشراف عرفوا بالتاكيد انه انهم لن يحصلوا على حكم عربي في كل العراق وكل بلاد الشام والحجاز خالصا لهم. فيما بعد باشرت القياده البريطانيه لارسال عده رسائل الى الشريف حسين بن علي ولابنه فيصل. الرسائل كانت هي عباره عن تطمينات انه هذه الاتفاقيه هي لترتيب الامور في المستقبل وعمليه تنميه المناطق وهي فقط لتوزيع المصالح لكن لا يمكن نهائيا التنازل عن مبدا السياده العربيه والدوله العربيه وغير ذلك. على الرغم من كل ذلك هذا لم يقنع العرب لكن في نفس الوقت هم مجبرون على ان يواصلوا مسيرتهم للوصول لهدف النهائي طالما انهم قطعوا الشط الطويل ولا فائده من العوده إلى الجانب التركي والألماني بأي شكل من الأشكال. In 1917, the Allies made significant military gains on several fronts. The British pushed into Iraq, and General Edmund Allenby led the forces that ultimately ousted the Ottomans from Palestine. But Allenby's continued advance towards Damascus caused the French serious alarm. They had expected to have complete control of the Levant under the terms of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. La, la Grande Guerre change complètement la donne parce que, euh, en raison de la campagne menée par le général Allenby et la situation militaire a inversé complètement les rôles. Ce sont les Anglais qui, désormais, ont le leadership. Les Français sont tout à fait minoritaires en termes de troupes, mais il y a cet accord de, de, de 1916, l'accord Sykes-Picot, qui permet aux Français de dire « Vous, Anglais, vous avez déterminé un territoire, laissez-nous le prendre. » Allenby and the Hashemites took the Syrian capital on the 30th of September 1918. And within a week, Prince Faisal bin al-Hussein had announced the establishment of an Arab constitutional government in Damascus. أصبح في هناك توجه قوي حول يعني إلغاء سايكس بيكو التخلي عن سايكس بيكو ومحاولة إيجاد صيغة أكثر إرضاء وصيغة تناسب مع الجهد الذي قام به البريطانيون في الشرق الأوسط. The First World War ended in stages. With the Ottomans agreeing an armistice on the 30th of October and Germany on the 11th of November 1918. Allied troops entered Istanbul and the time appeared right to implement the Sykes Pico agreement. But the British appeared to be having second thoughts as they sought to claim a larger share of Ottoman Arab territory in the region. The British Prime Minister. David Lloyd George met his French counterpart, Georges Clemenceau, in London on the 4th of December, 1918. So, it is over. Europe is safe, but the sacrifices were great. And uh, France, Prime Minister, sacrificed more, perhaps, than any of us. As the Ottoman Empire is no more, but that was due to your sacrifices, Monsieur the Prime Minister, and for those we are most grateful. You will take some tea? 
Ah, mais oui, merci. Uh, now, we will have to settle our claims on the area at the peace talks. We have uh, fought a little over those claims. You would like, perhaps, that we uh, modify ours? We had our eye on Mosul. You shall have it. And perhaps something else. Palestine? You shall have that too. فرنسيين كانوا يريدوا يفرضوا شروط قاسية على الألمان ويأخذوا من الألمان يعني جزء من المناطق المتنازع عليها وكان يريد الدعم البريطاني في مؤتمر الصلح ففي المقابل كلمنسو تساهل فيما يتعلق بفلسطين لكن فيما يتعلق في الموصل قدم تنازل بهذه الجلسة تقريبا أصبح واضح إنه سايكس بيكو انتهت the signs of the Sykes-Picot agreement being superseded began to emerge at the start of the peace negotiations in Paris in January 1919. The victorious allies were about to impose harsh conditions on the vanquished, and the British and French to decide which of the conflicting promises they had made during the war would be implemented. And so, from this moment, Vous avez une négociation complexe avec des hauts et des bas, des retournements, des scènes dramatiques, parce que on est dans la comédie diplomatique où chacun joue son jeu, euh, qui va durer en fait de décembre 1918 à avril 1920, avec euh, des inflexions considérables. ساد على الأقل بين الإنجليز وبين الفرنسيين تفاهم بأنه بعد أن أنهزموا الحلفاء ألمانيا كان من الضروري إبقاء هذا الحلف بشكل متين وقوي لمواجهة عودة ألمانيا كقوة عزمة فكانوا يختلفوا وبعدين يرجعوا ليقولوا والله بس الحاجة أكبر لأن نبقى مع سوا لمواجهة ألمانيا in April 1920, the four main allies, Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, met at the San Remo Conference. They created three entities, Mesopotamia, Syria, and Palestine. The French forced Faisal out of Damascus and took complete control of Syria. Britain took Mesopotamia and Palestine, including Jerusalem, which had been under international administration under the terms of Sykes-Picot. So, really, it's San Remo we should be talking about if we want to say, what does the modern Middle East look like? And the striking thing is this. If Britain had been concerned to preserve relations with France right through this negotiation, right through this process, they failed. Because the French looked at Sykes-Picot and they looked at the map of San Remo, and they realized that they got much less in San Remo than they had been promised by the British in Sykes-Picot. We overlook these things, but in a sense, I think that Sykes-Picot reflects a failure of trying to negotiate a happy resolution of British and French territorial ambitions in the Middle East. Britain came out with more and the French never forgave them. France had insisted on Mosul in the Sykes-Picot negotiations, but at San Remo, they conceded it to Britain despite the fact that it was known to be rich in oil. Or, they discover very rapidly that even if the de petrole que the French are searching for in the village of Mosul, ce sont the English present in the Turkish Petroleum Company who have the concessions, and not the French. So the French risk to have the territory without the concessions. Les Anglais ont les concessions, mais ils n'ont pas le territoire. France got a bit more territory in the in the south, along the southern edges of the what would become the Iraq-Syria boundary. It got more there. It got 25 percent of of any oil uh, that would be produced from Mosul, even though that was going to now be developed as a British concern. On the international stage, the League of Nations now created a series of mandates. It placed some new Arab territories under the supervision of the British and French, a kind of occupation in disguise. 
l'article 22 de la Charte de la Société des Nations qui définit les mandats. Et les mandats sont définis de façon contradictoire. Euh, parce que dans l'article 22, on dit que les mandats sont une tutelle, mais on dit que ce sont un conseil. Si c'est une tutelle, la puissance mandataire contrôle étroitement les actions de leur pupille. Si c'est un conseil, la puissance mandataire ne fait que conseiller et non pas ordonner. The British and the French did overcome their differences in their carve-up of the Middle East and agreed on concrete borders in December 1920. A joint French-British committee was set up to deal with the matter. ما بين العراق وسوريا وما بين لبنان وفلسطين هو أن الزباط الفرنسيين والزباط الإنجليز كانوا يمشوا على طرفين ما أصبحت فيما بعد الحدود من قرية إلى قرية من منطقة إلى منطقة وقالوا هذا إلك هذا إلنا عملية as well as dividing up the region into three new entities and implementing the mandate system. Britain and France further split the territories they now controlled. The French divided Syria into five states, including Greater Lebanon. مجرد سيطرة الفرنسيين على سوريا قاموا في البداية بتوسيع متصرفي الجبل لبنان العثماني بأخذ مناطق قطاعات من بقية الألوية. السورية لولاية دمشق ولولاية الصيدة وصنعوا لبنان كما نعرفه الآن Syria was divided into the states of Damascus, Aleppo, the Alawite state and Mount Druze Lebanon would become a republic six years later في دمشق كان تيار توحيدي لا تكون دعوا سوريا على على ما هي ولا تقسموها وكان هناك تيارات انفصالية أيضا فكان على الفرنسي أن يوازن بين الأمرين لأنه ماذا يريد الفرنسي هل يهم الفرنسي أن يقسم أو يوحد لا ما يهمه هو أن تستمر سيطرته. The British Colonial Office organized the Cairo Conference in 1921, hosted by the new Colonial Secretary Winston Churchill. It drew another important line within the British area of influence, separating the land east of the River Jordan from Palestine. Churchill came to this brief without any pre-existing ideas on the future of the Middle East. He was, in a sense, moving as quickly as events were to try and put in place administra administrative structures that could prove effective in securing Britain's interest, at least cost to the Exchequer. I mean, there had been some uh, proposals, which, uh, particularly from the Zionist organization, which were pushing for a, uh, a Palestine being defined in much more extensive terms to include the East Bank of the Jordan as well. But uh, in the end, uh, Jordan and Palestine ended up being under the same British mandate, as you know, at the end of the First World War. And then we simply had an order in council that established, if you like, its first main border in 1922. When the Hashemites failed in their bid to establish an independent Arab kingdom, the Cairo conference created Transjordan, with Sharif Hussein's elder son, Abdullah, as emir. Iraq was created in Mesopotamia with Hussein's younger son, Faisal, as king. Faisal had been a commander in the Arab revolt and was the deposed king of Syria. If we look at Iraq's territorial definition today, there were zones envisaged in Sykes-Pico that cut across it. Um, but the actual boundaries uh, to be drawn, I suppose, for Iraq after Sykes-Pico, the first one would have been shortly after Iraq had been created in 1920, was the Anglo-French Convention of December 1920. In Istanbul, capital of the former Ottoman Empire, Mustafa Kemal, Ataturk, successfully resisted foreign attempts to divide the Turkish-speaking lands. He led the Turkish War of Independence and repelled the Greeks, 
Italians, French, and Armenians. Ataturk united the country, and the new Turkish Republic was proclaimed in October 1923. But globally, the borders will be Elles vont s'installer progressivement, tout simplement à cause des événements politiques. Euh, quand la Syrie entre en révolution contre les Français en 1926, ah ben on voit immédiatement la différence entre la Syrie, la Palestine et la, Cisjordanie, et la Transjordanie. Quand les, les Palestiniens se révoltent en 1937, on voit la différence entre euh, la Palestine, la Syrie, Et le Liban, d'un côté, vous êtes dans une région en guerre, de l'autre côté, vous êtes dans une région en paix. The Syrian Revolution in 1936 finally brought about a French exit and unified the country. By the end of 1946, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan and Syria had all gained independence. British and French forces left. But now, there are sometimes differing views as to whether the borders the two powers drew were really the root cause of the problems the Arab world has experienced since. It's very hard to blame regional problems in the 20th century on the ways in which the borders were drawn. The, the most you can say, if there is a, a original sin to Sykes-Picot, it's that those borders were drawn without consulting the people who'd have to live within them, and for never securing the buy-in of those who'd be most directly involved. The borders were themselves to prove unstable. This is the nation-state on what we call the nation-state, meaning the nation-state in the meaning of the European Union. But it didn't solve the nation-state in the region. It changed the nation-state من ان هي مجرد يعني اثار لتعدديه وتنوع ثقافي في الفضاء العثماني حولها الى اداه وارضيه لصراعات دمويه منطقتنا اهم منطقه استراتيجيه في العالم كانت ولا تزال اسكندر المغول الرومان لا نابليون منطقتنا مهمه جدا استراتيجيا لل لل للذي يريد ان يسيطر على البحر الابيض المتوسط وعلى العالم إذا مستهدفين شقينا أبينا هذا أولا ثانيا منطقتنا تحتوي على الكثير من نفط العالم In part two, we'll ask whether the superpowers of the 21st century have ignored lessons in the wake of Sykes-Picot and sought to create yet more division and boundaries in the Middle East than ever before. The League of Nations mandate for Palestine came into effect in September 1923. It stated that the Allied powers had agreed that the mandate be responsible for establishing, quote, a national home for the Jewish people. من أجل توفير إمكانية إقامة دولة أو على الأقل وطن يهودي بفلسطين فمنحت مثلا تشكيل الوكالة اليهودية كجسم تمثيلي لليهود بفلسطين وأيضا مكنت الهجرة اليهودية إلى فلسطين من, من أوروبا من روسيا ومناطق أخرى I think that uh, Zionist diplomacy was brilliant in, uh, in a way, manipulating uh, uh, British uh, philo and anti-Semitic uh, uh, feelings at the same time, because uh, this fantasy of, of presenting the Jews in America as the key to whether or not America would participate in the war, and by presenting, uh, exaggerating the power of the Jews uh, worldwide, In the coming years, Palestinians would fight several campaigns, from demanding independence from Britain 
to trying to stem the tide of Jewish immigration to Palestine. The movement culminated in the revolt of 1936, which took the form of strikes and armed resistance. انتهت الثورة العربية الكبرى عام 39 مع نشر ما سمي عليه بالكتاب الأبيض البريطاني واللي طرح أن تقوم حكومة عربية على فلسطين بعد عشر سنوات وأن تقوم على كل أراضي فلسطين مع السماح لاستمرار الهجرة اليهودية إلى فلسطين لمدة خمس سنوات قادمة القيادة العربية آنذاك يعني بقيادة الحج أمين الحسيني عارضت الكتاب الأبيض البريطاني تماما والذي أيضا عارض الكتاب الأبيض طبعا الحركة الصهيونية بكل أطيافها واعتبرت أنه الكتاب الأبيض البريطاني يمثل أكبر تهديد ممكن للحركة الصهيونية And the British crushed this revolt The Zionists weren't strong enough at that time They didn't have the military capability um, The British brutally put down the Arab revolt And it's arguable and I would argue that Palestine wasn't lost in 1947-48. It was lost in the late 1930s when Britain put, put down so firmly the Arab revolt and destroyed all Palestinian military capability. The British mandate in Palestine ended on the 14th of May 1948. As it ended, David Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of a Jewish state to be known as Israel. The same day, the armies of five Arab states moved into the former British mandate. The 1948 Arab-Israeli war lasted almost a year, the first of several subsequent major border conflicts. Israeli settlements beyond its recognized borders have also continued Israel's expansion. الجماعات الأكثر تطرفاً عقائدياً كانوا يتطلعوا إلى توسيع حدود إسرائيل لتشمل ما اعتبروه أراضي مملكة إسرائيل التاريخية والتي تشمل ما نعرفه اليوم بالأردن يعني شرق نهر الأردن لكن يعني حسم هذا الصراع فعلياً بال 48 بغلبة حركة حزب العمال الإسرائيلي ويعني كان هناك اتفاق ضمني في داخل إسرائيل بأنه لن يكتمل المشروع الصهيوني حتى حسب نظر المعتدلين يعني حزب العمال سوى عند بلوغ حدود نهر الأردن واكتمل ذلك طبعا إثر حرب عام 67 The balance of power has remained in Israel's favor In 1967 it expanded its borders in the Six-Day War to include the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights. يوجد حوالي 500 إلى 600 ألف مستوطن إسرائيلي يهودي في داخل أراضي يفترض أن تتبع للسيادة الفلسطينية مستقبلاً وهذا كان القصد من استيطان مناطق معينة في داخل الدفل الغربية والقدس الشرقية بشكل خاص من قبل بعض الجماعات الإسرائيلية التي أرادت أن تجعل من المستحيل إقامة دولة فلسطينية بالدفل والقطاع وبالتالي ربما أن المجتمع الدولي مضطر إلى الإقرار بواقع جديد وهو أن لا مجال لدولتين دولة فلسطينية ودولة إسرائيلية Those people in Israel today like President Rivlin who call for a binational state, they ask, they insist on uh, civil rights for the Palestinians, human rights for the Palestinians, equality for the Palestinians in terms of economic, social and cultural issues, etc., but not political. That is, this will remain the state where Jews would have the upper hand, politically speaking. And that binational state would be open to Jewish immigration, but not to Palestinian immigration. I mean, what kind of a state is it going to be? It is going to be, as I say, the South African state without a South African solution. Like Palestine, Iraq has also been affected by the legacy of Sykes-Picot.
In 2003, a US-led coalition declared war on Iraq, believing it to possess weapons of mass destruction and aiming to oust President Saddam Hussein. However, the coalition didn't have a clear recovery plan for a post-Saddam Iraq, and sectarian and ethnic unrest seriously destabilized the country. We go back to Baghdad prior to the invasion of other areas. Uh, there were there were intermingled people lived the Shia and Sunni lived in the same areas. There were intermarriages. Uh, in fact, in the early years of the invasion, the Iraqis insisted there'd never be a conflict. They were too closely integrated. But the sledgehammer that smashed the society and the atrocities and so on that should be well known uh, did manage to instigate a conflict. Once a conflict starts, there's a predictable cycle of violence that takes place. I come, I think, primarily with three main objectives. The first is to support the administrator, Ambassador Jerry Bremer, uh, in what he is doing in this transitional period for Iraq. If you look at the history of modern Iraq since 2003, uh, you might say that no leader has come through who's been able uh, to settle Iraq and govern with the consent of enough of the majority to bring Iraq to a stable condition and to political security. أنا ذهبت إلى العراق بعد الحرب فورا من قبل الأمم المتحدة ورأيت جاري بريمر يصافح العراقيين واحد واحد أنت شيعة ولا سني وكنت أرى الهجوم والاستغراب على وجوه العراقيين لماذا؟ لأنه في بغداد وحدها كان هناك أكثر من مليون عائلة تقوم على التزاوج بين الشيعة والسنة فيبدأ الرجل والله أنا أبوي سني بس أمي شيعية لا يستمع إليه برمة إنه لا تهمني إذا إذا لم تكن واضح لم يبدأ حقيقة الأمر من تأسيس مجلس الحكم وإنما يعود إلى سنوات المعارضة في الخارج الإدارة الأمريكية كانت تستدعي ممثلي المكونات الاجتماعية العراقية هي لم تدعو العراقيين باعتبار أن بينهم جامع وطني اسمه العراق أو الهوية العراقية وإنما دعت الأكراد باعتبارهم أكراد ودعت العرب الشيعة باعتبارهم شيعة ودعت التركمان باعتبارهم تركمان وهكذا Iraqi resistance to the U.S. occupation increased as did sectarian killings The country fell deeper into chaos causing some Americans to call for the division of Iraq it was almost as though they hadn't studied the lessons of the post sykes pico periods. خيار التقسيم سوف يلحق الضرر بالشعب العراقي اولا. نحن لا سامح الله اذا اعلن التقسيم فنتوقع هجره متبادله على نطاق واسع ربما مذابح وقتول ايضا متبادله لا حصر لها وبعد ذلك سوف تمضي عشرات السنين حتى تستقر هذه الكيانات الجديدة إذا استقرت الدعوة إلى التطهير العرقي أو المذهبي أو الطائفي بحيث تقوم دول ذات لون واحد هي مجرد مشاريع تصطنع ضد الطبيعة سني ليدرز في العراق began to warn against the intervention of neighboring Shia Iran in the internal affairs of their country. They feared a sectarian war, which would lead the country into a spiral of violence and arguably make division the only option. Iraq was not in the days of the day of the Iran, but it was the Iran of the Iraq, and it was the Iran of the ودائما تروج ان العراق كان في يوم من الايام هو جزء من الامبراطوريه الساسانيه وينبغي ان يعود الى حضان هذه الامبراطوريه وهذا الذي حصل زرع الفتنه الطائفيه تحقيق للانقسام المجتمعي بين الشيعه والسنه 
فوجود كيانات ضعيفة سوف يغري دول الجوار من أجل تمدد والاستحواذ على هذه الكيانات الجديدة أهمية إراغة نظر السياسي برا ما وقت ما خلال عرصه بكنين بعد بحاجة صوت جنجة تحميلية ببنين حاجة صوت جنجة تحميلية شي بلاي سلام أمريكا ما أورد فس إراغ بهمون أندوزة مهمه ثبات و اینکه یک حکومت مردم سالار که دو مرتبه وسیله و بازی قدرت های منطقه یا بین المللی قرار نگیره برای ضربه زدن به ما به این دلیل مهمه پس اهمیت عراق اهمیت دموکراسی در عراق اهمیت توفیق این دموکراسی در عراق دموکراسی نیپان برای ما به اندازه لطمی هستش که از صدام خوردیم The Kurds managed to achieve autonomy in the Kurdistan region of Iraq in 2005. Their political leadership is now pushing for a referendum on independence, which could mean drawing new borders within Iraq. And it is true that the Iraqi Kurds are quite happy up uh, in Salamania and uh, where they are in their own uh, uh, enclave, as it were. Uh, but the United States continues to look for an Iraq which is integrous and not divided into three. Tfaqiyat Lozan wa Saksbiko lam tura'i masalih al-akhwa al-Kurd wa bittali tajid al-yom al-Kurd muqassameen ala taqriban arba' duwal aw akthar wa min haq al-shaab al-Kurd yain an takun lahu dawla fi nihayat al-mataf لكن في الوقت الحاضر أي حقيقة الأمر أي زعزعة في خارطة ساكس بيكو سيكون خيارا تدميريا للمنطقة بكاملها. The threat of division has also emerged in modern Syria. The Syrian revolution began in March 2011. The government of President Bashar al-Assad responded by waging a fierce war against all opposition. With far reaching consequences. It represents a major challenge facing the international community in 2016. The situation in Syria was exacerbated by the intervention of both Russia and Iran and their support for the Assad government against the rebels. اغتيال الحريري وحوصر ايضا الايرانيين انتبهوا انه في فرصه انه ياخذوا النظام السوري وياخذوا سوريا من خلاله واجا احمد نجاد عمل زياره خاصه وعمل اتفاق استراتيجي مع الاسد للدفاع عنه للتفاهم معه دخلوا الايرانيين كما لو كانت سوريا الهم وعم يدافعوا عنا على اساس انه هي اليوم منطقه نفوذ مكرسي ما فيش حركات زد مهر من سوريا راحت بان بوشتباني نمي كوني همونطور که گفتم ما اجازه نداریم دخالت کنیم در امور داخلی دیگر ملت ها این قانون اساسی ماست ما به این قسم میخوریم در این مجلس و رئیس جمهور هم میاد بعد از اینکه نمایندگان قسم میخورن به این هم خود رئیس جمهور هم به این قانون اساسی قسم میخوره که اینو اجرا کنه اونی که ما کمک سوری میکنیم مقابله با حضور خارجی ها و تروریست هاست در سوریه کسانی که میخوان سوریه رو ببرن به طرف تقسیم the UN stopped publishing the death toll in Syria in 2014, and the numbers are now thought to be much higher than official figures. When Russia entered the conflict on the side of the Assad government in September 2015, it began bombing opposition-held areas and has become a major player in the ongoing crisis. The Russians believe that they have created the Syrian army. قبل أن يلد مش بشار الأسد قبل أن يلد حافظ الأسد يعني أنهم يعني استولدوا سوريا الحديثة عسكريا وصناعيا في رأيي لا يمكن أن نحكم على المصلحة الروسية في سوريا بأنها المصلحة المتعلقة بالنفوذ عندما بدأ الرئيس بوش مزاولة سياسة مثلا لطاحة بالأنظمة أو مثلا نشر الديمقراطية والتدخل العسكري المباشر الأحادي الجانب ونحن بذلك ندافع عن الشرعية الدولية وحق للدولة في مزاولة سياساتها المستقلة. A Russian intervention which is to guard Russian interests in their oldest Arab ally. That Russian intervention makes Russia a stakeholder. 
so has to be brought into the talking that needs to proceed, as does Iran with Hezbollah as a proxy in Syria, and as does the European interest in the form of uh, the flow of refugees from Syria out into Europe, the interest of uh, the Europeans in a stable Near East and Middle East, and America in that role also of global stability, with a particular interest on top of that in the security of Israel. The international community is still trying to bring the parties together to find a solution to the Syrian crisis. But we don't want to divide this thing up. Or Dividing the country the is part of the debate. Whatever. And it's up to the Syrians. I mean, the Syrians uh, now, there. on the question of whether the country will be dissolved or not, or divided or not, uh, it seems to me that, that uh, it is already uh, divided in, in a very real way with the Alawites and the Christians and the other Shias occupying, occupying a certain amount of territory and the Sunni majority occupying the others. And I'm, I'm not very hopeful that Syria would be able to be put back together again. <laughs> the conflict in Syria has become increasingly sectarian. It has caused the internal displacement of hundreds of thousands of people and the international exodus of refugees on an unprecedented scale in the modern world. Some think that a form of federation is the only solution. I think that an Assad that controls the country might suit better the interest of Israel because he will be sort of the legitimized uh, ruler uh, after such a civil war, after such a carnage. The worst scenario is the disintegration of the, ne of the, of the country into uncontrollable uh, fiefdoms, as it were. No? So I think that uh, one, uh, one Syria complete with a regime that is not particularly legitimate in the eyes of the international community is something that would suit, I think, the, the current rulers of Israel. The Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIL, has also complicated the situation in Syria and has proclaimed the creation of a state in parts of Syria and Iraq. While American planes were bombing ISIL in Syria, they also enabled Kurdish groups to take control of certain areas of northern Syria in October 2015 and proclaim a Kurdish province there. This could be seen as encouraging the idea of a federal division of Syria, as well as causing alarm bells for neighboring countries. In Syria, they are trying to get some kind of cantons with the help of Russia, the United States, uh, and uh, Assad and Iranian regime. And a canton like Hezbollah style in Lebanon, a de facto habitat, uh, where internationally they may not be recognized, but de facto they would uh, operate over there 
and continue to attack Turkey or create kinds of problems in the region. In mid-2015, there were armed clashes in Turkey between the government of Recep Erdogan and the PKK. The Kurdish PKK, founded in 1978, wants a political entity of its own, independent of Ankara. In uh, Hizbel, Umar, Kurdistan, Elan, uh, Destamir Rufi, Intifada, uh, Wano Shertani, في إنهاء الانتفاضات أحدهما أن تعترف الدولة التركية باللغة الكردية وتجعلها لغة حكومية لغة رسمية في المدارس والثاني إعطاء الحق الحكم الذاتي بدون أن يتحقق هذان الشرطان لا يمكن أن يوقف هذا الحزب العماري الكردستاني هذه الانتفاضة. Mother tongue language as a being an official language in schools uh, is a legitimate demand and it could be expressed in the democratic society. So I don't see any legitimate and logical uh, demand for any kind of autonomy. Even if it was there, it, it is going to be PKK's demand. And we are not in place to debate or negotiate that kind of autonomy with PKK on the behalf of all Kurds or Turks. The ultimate legacy of the Sykes-Picot agreement was to establish the right of outside powers and interests to intervene and influence the politics of the Middle East. The sense of instability and constant conflict it has engendered seems even more complex to address now than it was a hundred years ago.